Hello and welcome to Dielectric Videos. On today's episode, I'm going to be going over different types of electric motors. There's many, many different types of motors with different applications uh, that have different strengths and different weaknesses that I'm going to be introducing today. Now before we start, I'm going to go over the basics of how the most simple motor, which is the permanent magnet DC motor, works. And from this, I'm going to then be able to explain the operation more or less in general terms of any of these subsequent motors. So first I'll show you how a, uh, how a single phase, or a DC rather, permanent magnet motor works on its most simple level, and I'll use this as the basis for the rest of our discussion. On the most fundamental level, a DC motor is nothing more than a loop of uh, cu current carrying wire on a rotor, and this, uh, this rotor has two brushes making contact with it, and uh, two sources of magnetic field, in this case uh, permanent magnets, are situated surrounding this coil. Now when this coil is perpendicular to, or when, uh, when it's, it's, its surface where the magnetic flux develops, is perpendicular to the position of the magnets, it's going to tend to orient itself uh, so that the magnetic flux is parallel to the magnets. Now when this happens, this rotates the commutator, which is this part here, which then moves the position of the brushes, which are connected to a fixed battery. And when this uh, commutator moves, it reverses the polarity of the electric current across the winding. This then reverses the direction of the, of the magnetic field, which causes the winding to flip again. Now as this winding continues to spin, the uh, commutator continues to rotate as the brushes deliver the current in the same orientation, thus rever uh, periodically reversing the direction of current in this loop, which creates a continuously changing magnetic field, which then results in its continuous rotation. This is how, uh, on the most basic level, a DC motor works. Now obviously in a practical DC motor there be, may be more magnets and more poles, that is more windings in the motor than just two, and the windings obviously will have many, many turns, not just a single loop. But the fundamental principle for the basic DC motor is this, and really, uh, if you look at any motor in general, similar principles to this will uh, actually take place. In some cases, as in the case of AC motors, there's no commutator, and the actual alternating nature of the electric current flowing in creates the commutation. In other cases, the commutation is controlled electronically using a, an integrated circuit or a transistor bank. But on the fundamental level, all motors are simply electromechanical devices which use interactions between electric current and magnetic fields to generate a rotating motion. So now I'm going to go on to describing the different types of electric motors and characterizing their operation. If you'd like to see me demonstrate actual motor uh, tests under operation and demonstrate their characteristics in person, feel free to skip this part of the video because I'm just going to be going over the many different types of motors and their applications and characteristics here. So here goes. Your electric motors can be generally ca uh, categorized into AC motors and DC motors. There is also a universal motor, which I'll describe when I describe DC motors later on. So we'll start with AC motors. They can be broken down into synchronous motors or induction motors, which are asynchronous by characteristic uh, and by convention. Now synchronous motors have a very precise speed, which is directly proportional to the line frequency supplied to them. Both their phase, and phase angle and their speed are directly synchronized with the line voltage. So as the alternating current rotates the motor, the speed of the motor is exactly a, a direct multiple of that alternating current. For example, a, uh, a single pole uh, motor operating at 60 hertz that is synchronous will operate at a speed of 3600 RPM. That is uh, 60 revolutions per second. Now, uh, these are very useful because their speed is, uh, is very precise. They also can operate with variable power factor depending on how the motor is, is wound. You can see a video on power factor on my channel. However, synchronous motors are not self-starting. They either operate at their full synchronous speed or not at all. That means you need another element such as a pony motor or even an electric or a, even a gasoline engine running to get a synchronous motor started initially. So those are that's the main drawback of these. Now induction motors are far more common in industry. Induction motors operate on the principle that you have a winding of conductor inside the core of the motor or inside the rotor of the motor which is completely electrically isolated from the stator. Electric current is passed through the stator in an alternating fashion 
And this induces an electric current in the rotor, which creates the uh, rotating flux that allows the motor to turn. Now, in the case of three-phase motors, this works very, very effectively. It's super efficient. They're self-starting. They match themselves to the operating line conditions, and they're relatively uh, low noise because the, uh, they basically match their phase with the line. A characteristic of all induction motors is that their, their speed, unlike the synchronous motor, does not exactly match the line frequency. It's usually very close to it, but it's usually about 5 to 10% below the line frequency. Now the reason for that is in order to induce a continuous changing magnetic field in the rotor of the motor, there always has to be some slip. Now slip is the difference between synchronous speed and the actual running speed of the motor. Induc in induction motors, slip is relatively constant across different loads, although increasing torque will slightly increase the slip of the motor. But as I mentioned, the slip is required to allow the motor to actually generate that magnetic field in the core and thus continue to rotate. Now, uh, the other type of motor is the single phase motor. This is the kind that you'll find in small industrial applications and in almost all household induction motors. Now these can be split into auxiliary motors, which use an off a physically offset winding to set their second phase up. PSC motors are permanent split capacitor motors, which use a capacitor to set the phase angle of a secondary winding similar to the auxiliary winding. However, they use the capacitor to set that phase angle instead. There's also start capacitor motors, which use a momentarily connected large value capacitor to give enormous starting torque. This capacitor is then disconnected to prevent overheating once the motor is up to speed. And a shaded pole motor is the final type of single phase motor I'm going to discuss today. It's a very special type of low power motor, which has a single winding and basically just a core connected to a rotor. And it uses a small copper rod wound around that core in order to create a phase angle that starts the motor. Now some advantages of the auxiliary winding motor is, is that they uh, don't require a capacitor, which means apart from the switching element that disconnects the auxiliary winding, they tend to be very robust. Permanent split capacitor motors have to have a, start, have to have a running capacitor. They may or may not have a starting capacitor. But as these capacitors wear out, the motors may become erratic and may stop performing normally. Start capacitor motors have to have the starting capacitor or else they'll just sit there and buzz. I'll demonstrate in a second with a PSC motor what happens when no capacitor is present. But very quickly without a capacitor, a start capacitor uh, motor will burn out because it's just sitting there conducting the full load current that it possibly could. And shaded pole motors are generally very cheap and also robust but they have very low power and torque, and they're usually used in things like exhaust fan motors and other small low power applications. Now I'll talk about some types of DC motors. I'll start with electronically commutated motors, and these include stepper motors, which are extremely precise DC motors that use pulses of electric current to set specific angular deviations in the rotation of the motor. So for example, every time a stepper motor receives a pulse, it may move like five degrees or, or three degrees or some arbitrary angular uh, rotation. This allows for extremely precise applications like CNC routers and other very specific where, uh, motor applications where the number of turns is incredibly important. Now servo motors are effectively stepper motors with a feedback through a Pi controller or other similar controller mechanism that allows the motor to continue uh, to basically self-correct for any error or deviation in its performance. Now a brushless DC motor is a really cool type of motor. This is actually uh, effectively a three-phase motor with permanent magnets, and it's an electrically commutated motor that uses the uh, feedback of a set of Hall effect sensors, which are magnetic field sensors, to determine the position of the motor so that the controller circuit can precisely rotate and commutate the motor at whatever speed is, is desired. Now these are super versatile, they have extremely high power density and low end torque. They're used in things like uh, quadcopters, electric scooters, hoverboards, anything where a lot of controllability and a lot of power for a small amount of weight and a small amount of volume is required. Now I'll discuss the brush commutated motors. These are the oldest types of motors. The very early electric motors in the late 1800s were mostly brush commutated. 
And the first type, which is one of the most common types uh, in larger industrial applications, is the series-wound electric uh, brush commutated motor. Now, a series-wound motor is basically equivalent to a universal motor in that it can run on either AC or DC. It's uh, primarily operated, of course, on DC for the application of being a DC motor. They have extraordinarily starting, high starting torque, which means when you hold the switch down on a series-wound motor, when it first starts up, it can turn over an enormous amount of torque. In fact, the torque actually, unlike almost any other prime mover, the torque actually gets weaker as the speed accelerates. They have relatively high power density and very high RPM when unloaded. Their, poor, their speed and torque regulation is poor though. If you run a, a brushless or a series wound DC motor uh, with no load, it'll actually rev so fast that it can damage its own bearings. This is one of the reasons why DC motors tend not to last as long as AC motors. Now these uh, are of course being a series wound motor uh, involves the rotor being wound in series with the stator. That means that the rotor takes the place or the stator rather takes the place of the permanent magnets. Another set of coils here are synchronized so that, uh, by position so that when current is flowing through these windings there's always a perpendicular current flowing through this, uh, the center rotor winding, which then forces it to spin all the time. Now these, of course, uh, are the counterpart of shunt wound motors, which are also similar to series wound. However, they have the outer winding, the stator winding, wound in parallel with the series winding. And usually in these, the system operates such that the core is saturated. Now this means rather than running away and going to an absurdly high speed unloaded, these actually have relatively good uh, speed regulation. The downside, of course, though, is the torque is much less at lower speed because the saturated core makes it so that the motor has a limited amount of torque it can deliver and limited power it can deliver. But of course, that is the trade-off for having better speed regulation at different torque, uh, torque levels. Now a compound motor has both series and shunt wound components, so it gives you some of the benefits of the series wound and some of the benefits of the shunt wound. It's basically a compromise between the two. And the last one is the permanent magnet motor, which is the kind that I introduced in the example on the back of this paper, in that it uses the permanent magnets rather than, uh, rather than coils to generate the magnetic field. Now this limits the intrinsic maximum torque that this can deliver, but it still can be moderate to high depending on the motor construction. It's the simplest type of motor, and one big advantage of permanent magnet motors is they can be reversed very simply by reversing the supply polarity. All these other motors can only be reversed if the, either the, the rotor or the stator it, uh, winding is reversed, but not both at the same time. But this permanent magnet motor, all it takes is reversing the input leads and it will spin the opposite direction. Now talking about different uh, rotational directions, PSC motors can sometimes be uh, changed in rotational direction by changing which winding the capacitor is attached to. And this can also apply to start cap motors which use the position of their starting capacitor to decide which direction the motor spins. The same can be said for auxiliary motors. Shaded pole motors, unfortunately, are only, uh, they only spin in whatever direction the, uh, the shaded pole or the copper wire has been wound on, the, uh, on the, ro or the core, so they're fixed in rotational direction. Three phase motors, on the other hand, can be reversed by changing any two of the phases going into them so that the phase rotation direction of the three phase supply is, is such that the motor then can rotate in the other direction. It basically has to do with which way the, the windings are connected with respect to the phases. Now the last thing I'll talk about before moving on to the demonstrations are the reliability and long-term performance of these types of motors. Uh, induction motors are ideal for applications where they have to run for very, very long hours. They don't have any brushes, so there's nothing that needs to be replaced electrically. The only parts that need to be replaced are the capacitors, which can go dry and wear out over time, and of course the bearings, which usually last a very long time, but sometimes need to be greased and even replaced. DC motors have much higher power density and are much faster, but the trade-off is they don't last very long. The brushes wear out very quickly and the bearings also wear out quickly. 
Another problem with brushed commutated motors is unlike the smooth performance of AC motors, they have lots of commutation noise. This means every time the commutator rotates, it creates big spikes in current draw, which can result in, uh, in unsatisfactory noise on the power supply circuit. So this is an overview of different types of electric motors. Now I'm going to show you some applications of the, these motors and demonstrate what happens when certain motors, uh, most notably the PSC motor, have their capacitor removed or placed into the wrong position. So we'll see that in a second. So the first motor I'm going to be demonstrating is a uh, simple DC mag uh, permanent magnet motor. It's a very small one and I'm going to be powering it with the six volt battery. Now, the notable thing to, to look at is there's a red wire and a black wire. So if I connect the red wire to the positive terminal of the battery and the black wire to the negative terminal, the motor begins to spin. And as you can maybe tell on the video, it's spinning currently in a clockwise direction. And I will try and slow it down to show that it's spinning in that clockwise direction. Now, if I disconnect it from the battery and I reverse the polarity of the wires so that the, the black wire is going to the positive, and the red wire, if I can get it, is going to the negative. Oops, let me get a hold of that. I'll slow it down again. Now you can see it's spinning in a counterclockwise direction. Now this is indicative that the uh, motor is indeed a permanent magnet motor because it no longer has a, uh, it doesn't have a fixed direction. Changing the direction of the input automatically changes the direction of rotation of the motor. So that's a basic demonstration of how the simple uh, brushed motor with permanent magnets operates. Here I have a permanent split capacitor motor from a fan whose capacitor here has been disconnected from the motor. So I'm going to energize it and I'm not actually sure what's going to happen because it totally depends on the position of the AC mains sine wave when I switch it on. Either it's going to rotate clockwise, rotate counterclockwise, or stay exactly in the same position. So I'm going to energize it, and then I'm going to play around with uh, loading the shaft, and I'll show you what happens when no capacitor is connected. So I'm going to energize it now. And as you can see, it has decided not to spin. Now, if I give it a little push, it'll start spinning. But you'll notice it's running quite rough because it's operating with one phase disconnected, the phase generated by the capacitor. I'll stall out the motor now, and I'll spin it the other way. You see, now it's spinning counterclockwise. So really, it uh, depends completely on what direction you tell the motor to spin if it doesn't have a capacitor. Now, if I connect the capacitor momentarily, you see it is now preferentially decided to spin clockwise. And if I stall it out again, you'll see it's, it's no coincidence. It will always spin clockwise. And also, if I connect the capacitor, the motor runs a lot smoother it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not fighting the rotation of that uh, empty phase or that unloaded phase when the capacitor is connected. That's why the fundamental principle of permanent split capacitor motors is, of course, that uh, the capacitor creates a second phase, which is out of, which is uh, at a different angle from the supply current, and that forces the motor to spin in a particular direction. So now I'll go on to show you the uh, universal motor in action. I have here a Makita electric drill with a universal motor inside of it. Now I know this is a universal motor because it's, it runs at a much higher speed. It has a commutator, which you can probably see, well you can't really see it in there, but it has a commutator. And if I power it with DC, as I'll show you in a moment, it runs just as well as when it's powered with AC. Now one reason that universal motors make excellent drill motors is that they have incredibly, incredibly low, uh, high low end torque. So this thing can turn an, a huge amount of, of torque when it's at its lowest speed. And that means it accelerates very quickly. So this makes for an excellent drill motor and an excellent motor for any sort of a small, uh, small electric tool, particularly when it has relatively short duty cycle. These motors don't like to run for very long because they are uh, very high speed and the brushes wear out. So a drill is a perfect application where you're only going to be running it for maybe a few seconds at a time, or maybe at most like five to 10 minutes if you're drilling really like boring through concrete or something. So as I showed you, this is running on AC and it has a triac based speed control. 
So you see I can vary it by squeezing the trigger. And I'll show you what happens next when I connect it to a DC supply. So now I've connected the drill to a full bridge rectifier, or as Electroboom would say, a full bridge rectifier. That means it's getting DC at about 170 volts peak. It has, of course, ripples in it, but for this application, it won't matter. The important thing to notice is, although the triac will no longer speed regulate, so I have to push it all the way down to get the drill to turn on, it will run at full normal speed, just as if it were running on AC. So as you can see, this drill does not care whether it's powered with a DC supply or an AC supply. And that's precisely because it uses a universal motor. The commutator of the motor inside, which I might, might be able to show some sparking on. Well, you won't get to see the sparking, but it does commutate in there. That's what creates the AC signal for the drill motor. It's not the supply, uh, the AC main supply that allows the drill motor to commutate and run like it would in an induction motor. It's instead the actual commutator itself. For example, I'll show you what would happen if I tried to run that PSC motor on DC. So now if I connect the permanent split capacitor motor to a DC source, you see it just makes a big spark, but it doesn't spin. If I leave it connected and try to rotate it, nothing happens. And even if I connect the capacitor, it barely tries to rotate because of the ripple, but nothing of any significance actually happens. So as you can see, AC motors don't run at all on DC, unlike universal motors. And if you do connect one continuously to DC, as you saw by the large arcs generated, it will draw so much current that it will eventually burn out the windings. In fact, just from those few seconds running, this thing has already gotten quite hot. So it's obviously best to run uh, AC, uh, AC motors only on AC. And one of the things I'll also mention is the AC and the, uh, and the voltage have to be properly matched. The motor has to actually uh, synchronize based on its power output. And if the voltage is too low, the motor will slip and draw excessive current. Now in the next part, I'm going to hook the oscilloscope up and show you what happens when a motor slips, how its current increases, and I'll also show you about commutation noise associated with universal motors. So next we'll move on to the oscilloscope part and I'll show you those phenomena. So here I have set up the oscilloscope and I have it connected so that there's a shunt resistor in order to detect the current. That's what's going to be displayed on the blue line, that is the current. And the yellow line is just the house voltage coming into the system. So I've configured it in the same way that I've configured my power line analysis setup in the power line analysis and power factor video. And what I was surprised to find was that the Makita drill was actually very clean, very little commutation noise. I did find an older drill that has a fair bit more commutation noise, so I'm going to switch it on so that you can see what I mean by the harmonic content that we're going to get on the current load on this system. So as you can see, the blue line is very wobbly and uh, unstable. It also has a very slight uh, lagging power factor. So this is a slightly inductive load with lots of ripple and lots of noise being thrown onto the line. This should tell you that a motor like that in use could potentially produce enough noise to cause problems for other electronics on the line, such as audio equipment or uh, computer equipment that may be sensitive to high levels of noise. So now I have the permanent split capacitor motor connected to the oscilloscope uh, power line analysis setup. Now, as you can see, the capacitor has been reconnected in the circuit. And as you can see on the screen, it has a, exhibits a very, very smooth blue current waveform. That's in contrast to the large amount of commutation noise we saw in the universal motor. Now, this is because there's no commutator in here. It's purely relying on the AC waveform to generate its oscillating magnetic field that allows it to rotate. Now one key feature of this motor is that uh, it has a relatively high inductance. Its power factor uh, is such that the current lags behind the voltage, and as a result it uh, would require power factor correction to bring its power factor into unity. Now I won't talk about power factor on this since I have a video on that already. Now one thing you will notice though is if I allow the motor to slip substantially by running it under load, 
the current increases markedly. Now that increase in current is due to a reduction in the, uh, in the opposition to the flow of current generated by the rotation of the motor. When the motor is rotating as close as possible to synchronous speed with as little slip as possible, it will actually draw the minimum amount of current. Now obviously it still has to draw enough current to overcome its own bearing friction and to maintain the magnetic field in the rotor. However, it does not need to maintain so much, it does not need to pull so much current as if it were just a straight coil of wire. When the motor is fully stalled, as it is in this case, you see a nearly unity power factor because the predominant source of, uh, of load in the motor is now the copper loss or the resistance of the copper windings in the stator rather than the magnetic loading in the circuit. So now you've seen how a permanent split capacitor motor works with its capacitor intact. Let's see what happens when we disconnect its capacitor. You can see that not much changes on the waveform. However, the motor suddenly gets much easier to stall. And I could start it in the other direction if I want, but of course that won't affect the lagging phase. And this is because the capacitor not only serves to start the motor, but also serves to provide that second phase that makes the motor stronger and allows it to deliver more torque under load. So that's the power line analysis of a permanent split capacitor motor. I have here an auxiliary wound motor. This is a very old one from the 1930s. So for this one, I'm actually going to be performing the same test where I stall the motor to show you the current load, and then I'm going to release it and allow it to spin up. And I'll show you what happens. The motor is now off. Now I'm going to switch it on with it completely stalled out and you can see a fairly substantial current draws in place. Now I'm going to release the motor and allow it to start spinning. You'll hear its auxiliary winding cut out with a clicking sound. Now if you saw those large spikes, that was the uh, auxiliary winding switch opening itself up. If I shut it off and try that again, you can actually hear it spinning down. That noise spinning down is the auxiliary winding cutting back in. I'm going to now engage it again. And right when you hear the clicking stop, you see that big commutation uh, sound, in the, or big commutation signal. Now that corresponds to a switch physically opening and disconnecting the auxiliary winding. It's a centrifugal switch, so as the motor spins faster and faster, it just pulls the armature off so that it no longer makes contact. Pretty interesting how auxiliary motors work. Before finishing this video, I thought I'd show you how a brushless DC motor is wired in and connected for performance. Now this uh, is a brushless DC motor in a hoverboard. It's built into the wheel. And interestingly, in this case, the rotor is the actual exterior of the wheel and the stator is the part inside in the middle. Now in this case, the magnets are located around the periphery of the inside of the wheel and the coils are fixed in the center. Now in this condition, we have three phase lines. These are our three phase motor drive lines going straight to the main board. And then we have a set of Hall effect feedback sensors. There are four wires, or actually there are five wires for this one. And uh, the electronic sensor is inside the wheel hub. And that also communicates back with the processor to decide when to commutate this wheel. Now you can see these switching transistors. Each of the two wheels on either side has a six transistor H bridge, and that configuration allows any two phases to be activated or deactivated at the same time, thus allowing the motor to be operated uh, get based on the feedback position from the Hall effect sensors. So your, the, your motor will be in a specific position, the current feedback state will be sent to the processor, and that will dictate to the processor which, uh, which state should be next in the round of uh, three-phase motor states. I'll give you a sneak peek of what an upcoming video is going to cover. I won't tell you what it's about, but you can probably infer it based on these cells. Anyway, hopefully this was informative. Hopefully you learned a lot about different types of motors and which type of motor might best suit your application and your project. Thanks for watching Dielectric videos. I will see you next time.